Hey guys, and welcome back to Everyday AI. Today we are focusing on a technical explanation of neural networks and why they are different from your brain. So if you haven't seen the first episode of AI 101 or the How Does AI Work video, I definitely recommend checking both of those out before you watch this video because this video is going to jump off from the first AI 101 video. So one of the things that we focused on in our last video was how neural networks work. They're made up of these thousands of computational neurons that allow us to find these subtle features in our data sets and make accurate predictions. Those neurons are called perceptrons and they take in information, weigh it against the other information it's getting, and output some sort of result. You can think of an individual perceptron as a linear classifier. Now, normally, when we talk about neural networks and perceptrons, we use the brain as a point of reference because originally, Neural networks were modeled after the neural structure of our brains. However, this isn't quite an accurate comparison, and it's actually been a point of contention within the scientific community for a while. So how are they similar, and how are they different? Well, as I mentioned in my video on the history of AI, the idea of a neural network arose from a hypothesis that the brain was built from a series of electrical connections and could be modeled as a computational or electrical system. As such, computational neurons were designed to have dendrites, or input vectors, soma, or a weighted sum, and axons, which connect neurons to other neurons in the network. However, that's about where the similarities end. Your brain contains about 86 million neurons that are connected by over 100 trillion synapses. These neurons are constantly firing, and the firing patterns may look somewhat random to someone who's on the outside looking in. That is, there isn't a directionality to it. The firing doesn't go back to front or front to back. On the other hand, we rarely see neural networks that use millions, if not tens of millions of neurons or trillions of connections to create some output, mostly because that would just be horrible to train. Um, a model that big would take forever to train to the point where you probably wouldn't get anything super useful out of it. Similarly, neural networks have directionality. You pass the data in on one end, and you get results out on the other. Backpropagation, which allows us to update the weights of each perceptron based on how well the model's output performed, in other words, going in the opposite direction from output back to input, allow us to move in more than one direction. So we can go forwards and we can go backwards, but that's about it. You don't see perceptrons connected to perceptrons that aren't in an adjacent layer, which you see all the time in the brain especially because the layer structure in the brain is not as linear as neural networks are. Along these lines, the biological neural networks in our brain and computational neural networks in our computers don't learn the same way. While computational models can learn features from data, they do require a preset architecture. You have to say what kind of model you're going to use before you can train the model. This might be a deep neural network or a recurrent neural network, but by making that decision on the type of network you're going to use, you've told the network what kind of information you're looking for. If you're using a convolutional neural network, then you've told the network that you're probably looking at pictures. Whereas if you're looking at a recurrent neural network, you're telling the network that there is some relationship in time between each data point. This limits the types of information that your network can recall. And these recollections are somewhat fixed. Once you've trained a model, you're only recalling the weights and biases of that model, at least until you train it again. It's kind of like computer updates. Whatever software you're running on uses the functions that are outlined by that software. And that doesn't mean that your software can't get better, but it takes the whole computer shutting down and restarting in order to get to that point. In contrast, our brains can make changes in the connections in our neural structure in real time based on learning and adaptation. Because of this, our brains are a lot more tolerant to mistakes or faults. We can correct our biases and minor mistakes aren't the end of the world. It doesn't mean we have to delete all of the information that was associated with it and reboot. On the other hand, bias avoidance and mitigation has been a huge topic in AI as of late and we haven't really found a good solution to it yet. Another interesting difference is energy usage. So your brain uses about 25% of your body's energy, which ends up being around 20 watts. Now that might sound like a lot, but your average household light bulb runs on between 10 and 40. In other words, your brain maybe would be able to turn on a light bulb depending on the light bulb. On the other hand, training and using a neural network on a GPU 
takes up to 250 watts, way less efficient than your brain. So computational neural networks aren't that similar to our brains, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful. In fact, that works in our favor when it comes to developing them. We don't have to make millions and millions of neurons in order to make accurate predictions. You can make a functional neural network in about four steps, and I'm going to go through them with some code that I wrote up here. So step one is going to be loading your data. Now, data sets can be found a lot of different places on the internet. I included some links in my last video to some places, um, and I'll include a larger list of places in this code for you to look at, but there are a ton of different places where you can get your data. I'm using data that's been pre-formatted, so I don't have to go in and arrange it in a way that makes sense for my model, which just makes life a little bit easier, but you can also collect your own data and organize it in the way that works for you. In this case, we're looking at images. From there, you can either create a new model or load an existing model. And in this case, we're actually going to do the second. This is one of the inception models, which is basically a pre-trained model that can classify images. So all we're going to do is retrain it with the new images that we're giving it from the data set that we're using. This means that we don't have to spend as much time training our model because it already knows most of the things it needs to know about classifying images. Step three is train your model. Here you can see the whole forward and backward directionality limitation. You see it training forwards and then doing back propagation to update the model at each iteration, but there's no other direction that the data can go. And lastly, predict with your model. Now we saved some of our data, usually about 20 to 30 percent from the beginning, and with that data we can see how well our model performs. And that's it! It may not work quite like our brains, but I'd say it's still pretty good. Thanks for watching the latest episode of my AI 101 series. If you like this series and you want to see more videos like it, you can let me know by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon, and thank you so much to everyone who has already. You can see those names in the description box below where they will be for every single video. The code that was used to create this video is in my GitHub. You can find me on social media here, and otherwise I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.